My bus route was a little different last night. It is 7.55, and my shift at my office job with a software development company was coming to an end. There are very few people here on the second shift, so all I can hear is the fans in my computer and the AC, along with occasional chit-chat. The clock hit 8. I saved the project I was working on, a new login system for our client's website, clocked out, shut off my workstation, and wished my colleague Jason a good night as I walked out the door. I live in the city and gas is expensive, so I take the bus every day to and from work. A bus stop is a couple of blocks away from my work. Between there and a bus stop is a coffee place owned by a good friend of mine. I stopped into his place and picked up a nice hot coffee, exchanged idle chat, and continued to the bus stop before sitting down to wait. It is 8.15 now. The bus usually shows up around 8.30. I catch up with social media as I wait. 8.30 arrived at the top of my phone, but the same can't be said about my bus. I waited for about 5 more minutes and still no bus. Just as I decided to get up and walk home, I heard the low roar of its diesel as the bus squeals to a stop in front of me. The bus sounded a bit off to me. There was a high-pitched whine coming from the back. I wasn't too bothered and boarded the bus. The driver's name is Eric. I have seen Eric pretty much every day for the past five years. He is the kindest person you could ever meet. He is the kind of person that will warm your heart with his greetings as you board. That wasn't the case on this cold winter night. Eric was looking straight forward, tensed up as if he was bracing for a crash. I said hello, and to my surprise, there was no reaction from Eric. He didn't even blink. I figured he was just having a bad day and walked to my seat. The bus was empty. Nobody but Eric and I were on it. There were always at least 10 people on board, people who have come to view as good friends. Before I could ask Eric about the strange vacancy, he closed the doors. I didn't notice when Eric set off. Finding out only by looking out the window seeing the surroundings fly by at an incredible speed. It looked like some form of hyperdrive from Star Wars. There was no feeling of movement inside the bus. I was getting nervous. So I called out to Eric. Eric? Are you doing this? Eric said nothing in return. Looking out the window again, the bus seemed to slow. I saw riots and protests blanketing the city streets. There was fire and destruction everywhere where. Cars were being vandalized and burned, businesses were being wiped from existence. Every other wall was peppered with graffiti. There were hundreds of protesters chanting something indiscernible. One of the protesters' signs seemed to indicate someone had died. Scanning other signs, my heart sank. It became clear to me that the man I respected, trusted, stood behind, and voted for was assassinated. The president was dead. Not just him but the vice president too. Who would do such a thing? None of the signs seemed to indicate who would murder our leader, our savior. My gaze turned to Eric. Can we please get out of here? I said, worried. As I figured, he did not react to my inquiry. A tear fell down my cheek. I couldn't look at the chaos anymore, so I looked at Eric with a disturbed snarl on my face. He was completely unfazed by the chaos outside. The bus sped up again. Everything was going by in a blur once more. I sat silently to gather my thoughts. My mind was wrought with worry. I didn't know if I would get home or if this was a dream. Is that really Eric in the driver's seat? The bus slowed once more. I looked outside. There was no more destruction. The world outside was very different than the one I left behind at the bus stop. There were so many people cluttering the streets of the now overpopulated city. Scattered throughout the landscape were several posters and signs with a portrait of a man I had never seen before. One of the portraits read, Your leader. This great nation of ours is a democracy. There is no single leader to guide our people. In one of the windows was a clock with data. The date read, 
July 13, 2027 I froze. I almost couldn't move as I was either in shock or having a full-on panic attack. This bus somehow traveled into the future. Twice. In one of the windows, there was an odd number of those signs. I was disturbed to see that a word that should never be associated with this country, a word that spat in the faces of our founding fathers. The word dictator ate into my soul, like seeing a loved one die in front of me. What level has our country fallen to? I wanted this bus to just take me home and do everything in my power to make sure it never came to this. Eric took the bus out of that place, or should I say time? Again, outside my window was a blur. Not wanting to see what else he had in store for me, I hit the button that instructed Eric to stop. Eric didn't stop. I got out of my seat, which is usually impossible for me in a moving bus as I get motion sickness, and walked over to Eric. Tapping his shoulder, I asked if he was alright and what was happening. Again, Eric didn't react. I was getting agitated, which reflected in my attempts to get his attention. After all else failed, I reached down to try and engage the parking brake. What happened next will stay with me to the grave. Eric's head snapped in my direction to gaze into my soul. His eyes were glowing red like taillights. Sit down, he said in a low unearthly voice. I froze solid. Eric, or whom I thought was Eric, was still staring at me. As I walked back to my seat, the bus slowed again. This time coming to a stop. Outside was devastation. The entire city was burned to a crisp. All I could hear was screaming and gunshots. It looked like a war zone, the cause of which I didn't want to think about. Bodies and gore speckled the cityscape. I could see one man with an Alaska 47 beside him clinging on to life. This couldn't have been much further into the future as that weapon was around in my time. Half of his body was gone, replaced by a trail of blood-covered innards. He had his hand up staring at me, pleading for help. I couldn't offer it to him. I was too scared to try and get off the bus to help him. I heard a shot to my right. The man's head had exploded, and I could see bits of what remained hit the window of the bus. I was almost relieved, but as he was no longer suffering. Before I could find a way to mourn him, he was only human after all. There was a blinding light in the distance to my left. It was as if the sun had teleported next to the earth and set it alight with all its hydrogen-fueled fury. I could do nothing but look away. Seconds later, I looked up, and a mushroom cloud took the place of the light. It couldn't have been more than tens of miles away. I could see the approaching pressure wave. A man in ragged clothes also crossed my vision. It looked as if he was the killer from before. My jaw hit the floor with a thud. I realized the man was me. He had to be in his sixties. The other me looked my way as a tear rolled down his face. I watched as the pressure wave arrived. With it came destruction that is hardly fathomable. The bus did nothing on impact. It was a static object. The same could not be said for the world outside. That which was still standing turned to rubble. That which was rubble turned to nothing. As quickly as the wave arrived, it had left. Nothing remained that was recognizable. The other me was gone, presumably killed by the blast. The mushroom cloud was now high above the base of a black cloud-covered sky. I didn't know if this was my future or some alternate future. Everything inside me wanted this to not be the future I would be a part of. Eric, in the same demon-like voice, spoke. This is not an alternate reality. He somehow knew what I had concluded to myself and confirmed it to be false. This is the reality that your kind has been moving towards for a very, very long time, he continued. The race you are a part of knows nothing but conflict. Peace is a hope you hold so dear to your hearts, yet do nothing to achieve it. I am here merely as a messenger. A messenger tasked with hopefully showing you what is to come, and perhaps your kind can finally make progress towards that singular hope of peace and unity for all. 
Who are you? I asked, walking back towards the front of the bus. His gaze to the front never faltered. My kind has evolved beyond the need for self-identification, he answered. I was confused. How can a race have no need to identify each other? Is there another way they do it? A much more important question crossed my mind. Where are you from? I asked. I am from a planet you know very well, in the future you know nothing about. He answered cryptically. You're us? I inferred. I almost didn't want to think about the human race evolving into such a strange form. Yes, my child. He replied. About 5000 years in the future. In your stage of evolution, you can only use a portion of your brain at a time. He continued. A long time ago, we discovered a way to utilize the entirety of our brains all the time. Our technological advancement focuses mostly on that aspect of ourselves. He read my thoughts, again. I am not really here. I have the ability to reach out to the past and control another mind, yours in this instance. Your body is actually still on its bus ride, asleep. I was relieved as I thought Eric was killed so the future human form could possess his mind. Eric just cheered me off the bus. I objected as I didn't want to see his time out of curiosity. He shook his head. I was disappointed but understanding. I slowly stepped off. As my foot crossed to the outside, it disappeared into what looked like a portal of some kind. I looked at Eric, who gave me a nod. Upon gathering the rest of my courage, I got off the bus. To my complete surprise, I was in front of my house as if nothing had happened. I turned around, and the bus was gone. With an overwhelming sense of relief, I fumbled with my keys and walked in before going to bed to contemplate what I had just gone through. Morning came around. It was a beautiful morning, perhaps the most beautiful. It was the kind of morning that you would want to have for your last day on Earth. The smell of bacon and eggs filled my house as I prepared myself a nice breakfast. I was in a good mood, almost forgetting about what transpired the previous night. I wanted to pass it off as the dream it was, but a voice in the back of my head was screaming at me to listen to Eric's warnings. The TV remote eluded me before I used it to turn on my small flat screen. Every channel was the same, same breaking news, same headline. President killed, 